Okay, good morning, everyone. It's okay. Good morning, everyone. How are you all this morning? Morning, Vasa. Good morning, well, John. Thank you. <laughs> Did you all enjoy the morning worship time? Yes. Okay, uh, before we begin this morning, can uh, somebody lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you, glorify your name. We bless you for this hour. Thank you for the teacher. Thank you for the student. Thank you for our family. We say be that exalted in Jesus' name. We commend this our class into your hand, Father. Come and minister to us yourself through your servant. Come and teach us yourself and take absolute control over the class. Thank you for answering our prayer in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. Are the verses on the uh, screen which I projected clear? Are able to read it? Yes, Pastor. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, we last week we looked at uh, the last bit of chapter 2 where we looked at the canon of the New Testament. Uh, we looked at what were the specific tests that were used um, uh, to identify which books were inspired and which were not. And um, hence, we saw that the books that were inspired are part of the New Testament, uh, which is there for us today in the Bible. We also um, discussed that, you know, there were some, there were a lot of other writings that were prevalent during the Old and New Testament times, the intertestamental time period. Um, and these books were not uh, considered uh, to be part of the Bible, and uh, they're called as the apocryphal writings. <coughs> Sorry, they're considered as the apocryphal writings. Apocrypha means hidden or uh, something secret. And um, why were they not considered uh, to be part of the Bible was because uh, they were not uh, inspired. They were not uh, considered um, as the word of God because uh, the people who wrote it, um, you know, uh, were not considered as people who were spokesmen or spokeswoman of God. Uh, and hence, it was not considered as the inspired word of God or uh, the words that God had revealed to them and which they had written. It was inconsistent with the rest of uh, biblical doctrine and biblical teachings. Um, and hence, we see that, uh, you know, these books were not considered to be part of the canon and hence part not part of the Bible. And then we ended chapter two by looking at the characteristics of uh, uh, God. Okay. And we uh, moved on to chapter three. And basically, we answered two questions in chapter three. Uh, does anyone remember the first question that we answered? What is the first question that we answered? in chapter three. Or what did we discuss, the first point that we discussed in chapter three? Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Abu Bakr. Anyone One remember? Yes. Yes. How do we know that God exists? Thank you. The first question we looked at was, how do we know that God exists? Okay. So uh, how do we know that God exists? What, how did we answer this question? Three things we said. Uh, through scripture, through inner sense. And through creation. Through, thank you, John. Yes. So we said everyone has a deep inner sense that God exists. 
Uh, we also saw that the evidence uh, uh, that God exists is uh, in his word. Um, you know, uh, throughout the Bible, we have evidence that uh, there is a God and that he exists. And creation also gives us abundant evidence of God's um, existence. Then we looked at the traditional proofs for the existence of God. And then we went on to the second question. Anyone remembers what was the second question we looked at? We spoke about the nature of God. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, yes, go ahead, Abu Bakr. Okay, uh, we are tried answering this question. What do we mean by the term right. nature of God? Right? So what do we mean by the nature of God? What do we mean by this term nature of God? Uh, God's characteristic attributes and qualities. Okay, thank you, Zil Toli. Uh, so, nature of God is basically his characteristics, his attributes, and his qualities. Uh, so, when we are saying his attributes, his uh, his characteristic and qualities, we are basically saying who God is and what he does. And how is God's nature revealed to us? It's revealed through his attributes and through the names of God. There are various names of God in the Bible. And so God's name and his attributes reveal his um, nature. We see that um, the word of God reveals the nature of God. Uh, uh, creation, all of creation reveals who God is. It reveals and speaks about the greatness, the power, uh, uh, and the perfection uh, of God and his nature. Uh, and which is the best uh, revelation of God? Or through whom do we know the exact nature of God? Through Jesus. Yes, through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Logos in flesh. The Word became flesh. So Jesus Christ is the perfect expression. He is the perfect representation of the nature of God. And uh, God's true picture of who he is and what he does is revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse um Three, And we ended uh, last class by saying that God's word and his works are always consistent with his um, nature. That means we said that, you know, God will never say or do anything that contradicts who he is or will contradict what he has spoken or what he has uh, done. Now, what do we mean by this? Okay. Now, for example, um, if um, I'm, I you know, get sick with a, a sickness, a terminal sickness, say, or uh, anyone gets sick with a terminal sickness and they're a believer, you know, uh, they can uh, say that, you know, um, God is punishing them or um, God is, uh, you know, using the sickness to correct them for some sin or, um, you know, um, that God does not love them, he doesn't care for them anymore, or he doesn't value what they have done, or they have put their trust in him, and some of them can get very angry with God. Okay, so is this true? No, that's not. Why is it not true? Because it doesn't stand consistent with the word of God. But word of God says he is... His love is everlasting. He loves us from eternity. Okay, thank you, John. Yes, uh, when people say such things or think such things, they always need to interpret it in the light of the word of God and which reveals the nature of God. Now, God's nature is not to put sickness and uh, disease. Uh, you know, God is uh, a healer. He says, I am the God who heals you. That is his covenant name, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer, God, our healer. So God cannot give us something that he does not really have. So is there sickness in heaven? No, 
there's no sickness in heaven. So God can not basically give us something that he does not have. So we can't say that God has given us the sickness, you know, uh, maybe or got us into this accident where we uh, broke our leg or fractured our leg and, uh, you know, we have to rest. So God is telling me that, you know, I need to take time, uh, take a break and just rest because I've been so busy with work or ministry or whatever. That's a wrong interpretation because God cannot do that. It's against his nature. And uh, we can't say that God does not love me um, or, you know, he's angry with me. And so he's punishing me. Um, you know, uh, God's uh, love is always consistent. Uh, he's the same yesterday, today and forever. He loves us. God is love. Uh, and because God is love, uh, it says in 1 John, you know, he cannot hate. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, the different part of uh, punishment and why we fall sick, you can, uh, you know, you can, uh, you will learn more about that in uh, healing and deliverance class. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, we, this is contradicting God's nature and we cannot speak like this. We cannot think like this. And these are lies that we believe for our self. And let me give you another example. Um, now, for example, we see a person who's greatly anointed by God, just flowing in the gifts. And um, uh, when the person, he or she is preaching or teaching, there's uh, revelation just, just, you know, uh, in in their, uh, their sermons. And there's so much of in-depth revelation and deep truth that they reveal, the way they teach, uh, 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 the mighty anointing that flows through them, that people are healed and uh, delivered. Now, we can say that God is... Is, uh, you know, has chosen them, is, you know, has anointed them with a lot of gifts uh, then compared to me or, um, you know, God is very partial. Okay, is that the right way of uh, thinking or is the right way of understanding or uh, judging God? What do you think? No response? Well, that's not because God, we know that scripture tells us that it's not God's nature to be partial, right? Uh, it's not God's nature to be partial. Uh, God bestows his gifts on everyone. Um, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, each one of us receive all the nine gifts. Uh, yes, it says that the Holy Spirit determines which gift, but does not mean that he will give uh, five gifts to uh, one person and he'll give, um, you know, one or two gifts to another person. No, it's uh, it means that in that particular situ situation, when we are praying or ministering to somebody, which is the best gift that is effective to minister that the Holy Spirit will release to us. But if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, all of us can manifest all the nine gifts of the Spirit. And we know that God is not partial. Uh, you know, he loves everybody. He'll, uh, he'll just move. But the, uh, 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 the anointing, the level of anointing depends upon our choices and how much we choose to spend time with God, spend time in the presence of God. You know, that is the extent that, you know, the anointing and the presence of God will be released through our life. Or some people can say, you know, God is uh, very unfair or he's very partial. He's chosen some people, uh, you know, to know him and they've received salvation and some people are destined to go to hell. Now, is that the truth? What do you think? Does God choose some of us no. to know him and to receive salvation? Okay, no. Why do you say no, John? John 3.16 says, God so loved the world, because, um, which says he loved the entire human being, uh, uh, entire mankind, human race. And whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So that's God's intent for us, all of us, to be with him. Yes, thank you. So First Timothy also says that it's God's good, pleasing, and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Okay, so it's, uh, what is God's good, pleasing, and perfect will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of 
of Jesus Christ. So, uh, you know, it's not that Jesus, cho God chooses few of us for salvation, few of us, you know, to be destined to hell. No, he wants everybody to be saved. He did not create hell for us, but he created hell only for death, this, for Satan, for the, uh, for our enemy and not for, uh, uh, for mankind. And God wants everyone to be saved. So now when we are making such statements, it's contradicting God's nature. And that is why it's so important for us to know the nature of God and what Whatever God does is always consistent with what he has already revealed in his word and, um, you know, uh, what he's revealed through his works. And also it is important for us to know the nature of God so that we can also know God's will in a specific situation. Sometimes we are praying on what is your will? What is your will? And uh, God is saying, my will is so evident. This is not the person you marry. Why this is not the person you marry? Because this is not the person who's a believer. The, my word clearly states that you cannot be, uh, uh, you know, yoked with an unbeliever. So sometimes, you know, we are waiting to know God's will, but God's will is already revealed in his word. And so it's important for us to know God's word. And it's important to know the nature of God so we can understand who God is and interpret things see things in our life and also understand his will understand the uh, the path that he's opening for us where we need to go what we need to do when we understand his um, nature okay so we're going to look at some of the attributes of god and then we will look at god's names that reveal his nature but before we look at god's names we will look at god's attributes that reveal his uh, nature now there are a lot of uh, if you look at your notes course notes there are a lot of references that i given uh, we don't have time to go through all those references so i've just put up the references on the screen as i just mentioned it i would request you to quickly uh, just read those references or um, even please take time to, you know, after class uh, to spend time, some time just reading the notes and uh, looking at all the scripture uh, references, because it's not just important um, for us to um, attend class, but also for us to get a deeper knowledge of the nature of God, because it's going to benefit us in our daily life to understand God, his ways, his works, and what he's doing in our lives and his will for our lives. Okay, so with the first attribute of God that reveals his nature that we're going to look at is God is the creator, and that he is eternal. Genesis chapter 21, uh, verse 33, and uh, says that he is the everlasting God. Psalm 90 verse 2 says that from eternity to eternity, he is God. And so we've, uh, uh, you know, I've already mentioned this in the previous class that, you know, no one made God. He's, he always existed in the previous class. We looked at it. Um, he's self-sufficient. He's uh, self-existent. He does not depend on anyone or anything for his um existence and hence he is eternal that means there is no beginning and there is no end there was never a time when he was not there never be a time when he will not be he he was always he always is and he will always be and uh, unlike god you know we are all created beings um we have a beginning and we also have an end colossians chapter 1 was uh, 15 and um uh to 17 says that all things were created um, uh, through him, uh, sorry, all things were created by him, through him, and uh, for him. So we see that, uh, you know, um, everything has its life in Jesus Christ. Yeah, he created everything. Everything has life in him, and everything is sustained through him and by him. He's the one who sustains life. He's the one who sustains everything in that we see in uh, creation. Okay, that is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. The next attribute of God that reveals his nature is that God is spirit. Okay, now when we say God is spirit, what do we mean? What do you understand by this God is spirit? Yes, go ahead. God does not have a mortal body. Okay, thank you, John. God does not have a mortal body. Yes, go ahead, Abu Bakr. He's divine person without human body. 
Can you say that again, please? It's a divine, divine person without human body. It's a divine person? Body. Yes. Okay, he's a divine person. I didn't get the latter half of it. Uh -huh. He's a divine person without human body. Oh, thank you. Okay, he's a divine being or a divine person uh, without a human um, body. Yes, thank you. Now, how do we know that God is spirit? How do we know that? It's revealed to us in scripture. Uh, John chapter 4 verse 24 says that uh, God is spirit and all those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Psalm 139 uh, verse 7 to 10 says, where can I go from your uh, spirit? So when we uh, say that God is spirit, uh, we mean that he does not have a natural, mortal, physical body like ours. However, uh, when we say that he does not have a natural, mortal, physical body like us, he is not some formless, you know, jelly-like, uh, impersonal, emotionless uh, spirit force. He is not uh, formless. He is not jelly-like. He is not impersonal. He is not even emotionless. Uh, and he is not a spirit force. But the Bible reveals to us that God has a form that is similar to us. So the Bible says God has hands, he has eyes, he has feet, uh, you know, um, uh, and he. It, the Bible also reveals that God is, has emotions. Uh, so we look at um, the, the various scripture passages that talk about this. I just picked up a one. Um, so how do we know that God uh, has a form, that he has a human body like us? He reveals himself to us as a person. As the Bible says, he has eyes, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, it says, uh, this phrase is repeated, uh, you know, um, again and again through this entire uh, passage in Genesis chapter 1, where it says, and God saw all that he had made and it was very good okay so god saw that means he has eyes god also has ears the psalmist says the ears of the lord are always attentive to the cry of the afflicted one god also has feet you know nahum chapter 1 verses uh, 3 to 4 uh, it says the clouds are the dust of his feet Okay, I'm just saying the latter half, the last phrase of uh, uh, verse 4, where it says, the clouds are the dust of his feet. And also we know that God has hands, okay? Um, uh, the, uh, in this verse that says, you know, God has engraved us. <clears throat> Sorry. God has engraved us on the palm of his hands. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 16 says, uh, See, I have engraved you on the palm of my hands so we know that god has a, a, a you know as a form that means he reveals himself to us as a person and thus when he speaks to us he speaks to us so that uh, in a way that we can understand because we are all uh, personal beings we are all people we are, have a personality we have a form and god also reveals uh, himself to us in a way that we can understand him okay the bible reveals to us that god also has feelings and emotions just like us uh, he loves us 1 john chapter 4 verse 16 says that god is love uh, he also cares for us psalms chapter sorry first peter chapter 5 verse 6 to 7 says uh, you know cast all your anxieties on him for he cares for you God also laughs, you know, just like any other human being. Psalms chapter 2 verse 4 says, He who sits in the heaven laughs. He weeps. Jeremiah chapter 9 verse 10, uh, it says, God said that he will weep and wail for the mountains. It's basically talking about the devastation of the land and the unfaithfulness of the people of Judah. And God says he will weep and wail. We also see in the uh, Bible that, uh, you know, uh, God is angered or he gets angry exodus chapter 32 verses 10 to 11 uh, god says now let, tells moses now let me uh, be alone let me uh, let then now then let me alone that my anger may burn against them and that i may destroy them and we also see that he's a forgiving god 
where you know um, we have various scripture verses uh, that says you know that uh, God is a forgiving God. He forgives all our sins, heals all our di diseases, is gracious and compassionate and merciful and forgiving uh, God. Okay, so we see that uh, God, uh, you know, has um, a, a personality or a form. He reveals himself to us as a person. He also has emotions. And so the Bible reveals to us that God as a spirit being, he loves and he cherishes a relationship uh, with us. And as a spirit being, uh, he's not somebody who is formless or he's not somebody who's emotionless, uh, but it's just the opposite. He's somebody who has a form and he has feelings, he has emotions. And, uh, be and because he has feelings and emotions, we know that uh, he is not just some spirit being or some force that is not able to relate to us, but he loves us and he cherishes to have a relationship with each one of us. He desires to have a relationship with us. And hence, we know that uh, this God who is a spirit being is also a very personal uh, God. Okay. And he's described to us as our father, as our savior, as a friend. Uh, and the Bible also reveals to us that those who believe in him, you know, uh, he considers us as his sons, as his daughters, as part of his um, family. So here we see that God cherishes or he desires to have a relationship um, with us. Okay, so Bible also records uh, at the times that, uh, you know, when God takes on physical appearance in order to communicate to man and theologians call this as epiphany or uh, also another word that is used is theophany. Okay, now what is epiphany? Epiphany comes from the Greek word which means appearing or revealing. Okay, so Basically, Epiphany focuses on God's self-revelation in Christ. Uh, the other word that is also used is Theophany and Theo, Theos. The Greek word means God and Phany means to appear. Um, so it historically, uh, it's been seen or been taken uh, to refer to as the appearance of Christ in the um, Old Testament. So uh, if you look at Exodus chapter uh, chapters 33 to 34, we see, you know, God revealing himself, uh, a theophany, um, you know, uh, where we see Christ appearing, revealing himself, uh, manifesting himself. And it says there that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend and there are various other scripture passages you know when the people of israel were moving or journeying in the desert in the wilderness uh, to go to the promised land uh, you know uh, uh, god's very presence was there by a pillar of cloud by day uh, and a fire by night that's the very presence of god and that is theophany that is jesus christ himself being with his um People, okay, so we see that you know uh, God manifesting Himself, or uh, is the physical appearance of God uh, in order to communicate uh, to man uh, something uh, which we see in the Old Testament, and this is referred to as Epiphany or Theophany, where God uh, self-revelation uh, through the uh, through Jesus Christ revealed in the uh, Old Testament. Okay, any doubts so far? Any questions? If not, we will move on to the next attribute of God that reveals his nature. Um, we will look at uh, that God is omnipotent, he is uh, omniscient, and he is omnipresent. Okay, Omni means all, so uh, omnipotent means all-powerful. Omniscient means all seeing or all knowing, and omnipresent means all uh, you know, present everywhere. 
okay so god is all powerful he is omnipotent uh luke chapter 1 verse 37 is there on your screen it says for with god nothing is impossible or with for god nothing shall be impossible uh, we know that god is powerful all the time god's power is uh, limitless it's absolutely uh, limitless there's nothing that he cannot do yet he has declared that there are certain things he will not do. Now, what are the certain things he will not do? For example, he cannot be unfaithful. You know, if he's unfaithful, that contradicts his nature and it cannot contradict his nature because he is God. He's a perfect being. Okay. Uh, another thing that God said he will never do, he said he will never lie. Okay. If he lies, that contradicts his very basic nature. And another example is that he can never stop loving us. And if he stops loving us, if he hates us, that means, uh, you know, it's, it's hitting at the very core of who he is. It says that God is love. That is who he basically is, his core being, his core substance, his core essence. And so there are, uh, you know, God is uh, all powerful. He can do anything and everything, uh, but he will not. Uh, you know there are certain things that he will not do he cannot be unfaithful he can never lie he can never stop loving the things that he he will not do are things that will contradict his um, nature okay um, and when he does not do certain things it's because he's contradicting uh, uh, or contrary to his characteristic and to his um, nature now an important thing to note is that god's power is released through his how is God's power released? Anyone? It's there on your screen, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. How is God's power released? Through his word. Amen. Yes, through his word. Thank you. God's power is released through his word. Um, we know that God's word is um, active and powerful and living and uh, God's word that he spoke is powerful. So even when we declare the spoken word of God in scripture, whether it is his promises, what he said he will do, uh, or we declare his covenant names over our lives, you know, it is powerful and God will bring it about. It will be a an yes and amen because God cannot go back on his word, you know. Uh, God is not a man that he can lie. God is not a man that he would, you know, he would change his mind and what he has said, he will surely do. Okay. So the first uh, aspect we looked at is, you know, uh, in, in the attribute of God, which comes to the third one, but in the omni uh, part of it is that he is all powerful. He is omnipotent. The next one is the, he is omniscient. That means he sees everything. He knows every um, thing. Let me just put up the next. Okay. Psalms chapter 147 verse 5 says, His understanding is infinite. It has no limit. Uh, Isaiah chapter 46 verse 9 and 10 says, you know, he declares, God declares the end from the beginning. That means he knows everything. He knows the beginning. He knows what's going to happen and he knows what is going to happen in the end. So he knows everything. That means he's omniscient. He, he knows everything. He sees everything. There's nothing that uh, that is happening in your life that God does not know, that God does not um, see. Okay, uh, he's also omnipresent. That means he is present um, everywhere. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 23 to 24. It's there on your screen. Um, the latter half of it in verse 24, uh, God says, uh, the, the Lord says, Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. So, you know, he's there everywhere. The psalmist also declares that in Psalm 139 verse 7, uh, says, where can I go from your spirit? You know, where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go down to the, uh, uh, make my depth, uh, bed in the depths of the earth, even the, there, 
your presence is there uh, and if i settle on the far end of the sea even there your hand will guide me and lead me okay so uh, wherever we are whether the bottom of the ocean or on top of the highest peak uh, 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 you know mountain peak in the world uh, you know the furthest part of the world uh, you know even there god is uh, with us he's present everywhere okay that means god is omnipresent so the three things that we saw was god is omnipotent he is all powerful he is omniscient he knows everything he sees everything he is omnipresent he is present everywhere now the sixth um, attribute of god that reveals his nature is that he is triune he is a triune god what do we mean by saying that he is a triune god triune god three persons in one okay one god in three persons thank you joy so uh so how does god reveal himself in three persons who are the three persons of the trinity okay go ahead joy the son the father and the holy spirit thank you god the father god the son and god the Holy Spirit, uh, where do we see Trinity? Uh, is Trinity mentioned in Scripture? Yes, no. Is Trinity mentioned in Scripture? Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you. Where is it mentioned in Scripture? At the time of creation, in Genesis. Okay. What does it say there? It says, let us make man in our image. If it was just a singular, it would say, let me make man in my image. But it says, let us make man in our image. Uh, we also see uh, Trinity in action or Trinity mentioned at the baptism of Jesus. Yes. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. Um, let me just project that. Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, um, where it says, you know, as soon as Jesus was baptized and he uh, came out of the water, at that moment heaven opened and um, they saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. So here we see Jesus, we see uh, uh, you know, God, the Holy Spirit, and we see or uh, we hear uh, the voice of God, uh, the Father. Okay, and there are other places also where Trinity is mentioned. Jesus says, "Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit." We look at uh, Trinity in detail. It's a whole chapter, so we'll be studying that in, in detail. We'll just move on. So we see that um, God, the Father. Uh, we know that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are eternal. Uh, they are co-equal, and all three are to be worshipped because all three are God, and they are one. Okay, So the Bible presents this fact uh, about this triune God and does not give us any systematic explanation about how you know one God uh, uh, you know, revealed himself in three persons or how three persons are in one okay so there is no systematic explanation it's just revealed to us and so we accept it uh, and believe it by faith and we see them uh, you know working uh, in in unity in in oneness um, and uh, the important truth for us to know is all three are god there are no three gods but they are one who reveal in three persons and uh, they are all of them have the same essence, the same being, the nature, uh, the characteristic um, of what makes God God. So they are all eternal, they're co-equal, and all of all three are to be um, worshipped. Now, uh, if we, understand, we want to understand Trinity, we can understand it uh, in this way, that each person of the Godhead work as one in unity and harmony. Uh, but, you know, they have different roles in terms that the Father represents the wisdom of the Godhead. He conceives things, he plans things. 
the son uh, represents the authority of the Godhead. That means he commands, he speaks, he said, let there be, and there was. And the spirit, the Holy Spirit represents the power of the Godhead. That means he creates, he brings about the spoken word of God. So God the Father conceives, uh, God the Son is somebody who is the authority, He, the Godhead, he commands things. Um, and God the Holy Spirit is the one who represents the power of the Godhead and he brings things about, he creates, okay? So that is about the triune God. We'll study uh, Trinity in detail uh, uh, in, an, in, in a few chapters uh, uh, or in a few classes to come, okay? Now, I think last week somebody asked us a question, um, you know, uh, when Jesus said, uh, the Father is greater than I, and um, asked uh, if we say that all three of them are equal um, and all three are God, then why did Jesus say the Father is greater than I? Uh, now, the Father is greater than the Son in position, okay, especially in regard to the incarnation, uh, but the Father is not greater than the son when it comes to the essence or the very nature or the being okay the father son and the holy spirit are all equal um uh, uh and, but when it comes to position in in with regard to incarnation the father is greater than the son but all three are equal okay father son and the holy holy spirit are all uh all God and all of them are equal. So here we understand that the Father and the Son are equal, but uh, the Father is greater than the Son in terms of position, especially with regard to the incarnation. Any questions? Any questions? If not, we will move on to another attribute of God that reveals his uh, uh, nature. Uh, God is infinite. Um, you know, we read this in Psalms chapter um, 147 and Psalms chapter 147 and Romans chapter 1 verse 20 where it says that, uh, you know, he is um, uh, limitless. That means uh, because he's God, he cannot be measured. He cannot be fully grasped. He's supreme. Uh, supreme means he's not somebody who's a superior being. When we say that he is a super, superior being, it means that there is someone greater than him. He is not a superior being, but he is a supreme being. There is no one greater than him. There is no one superior to him. So he is superior. He is great. He is almighty. He is all powerful. And he is eternal. Uh, we already saw this that he always existed. He always was. Uh, he always is and he will always be. He will always exist. There is no beginning to him. There is no beginning and there is no end to his existence, which means that he is infinite. The next attribute of God that reveals his nature is that he is holy and righteous. Uh, holy means that God is untouched by anything that is evil or any sin. He cannot be, uh, and he's unstained. He cannot be stained by anything that is sinful, dirty, or any form of he evil. The Hebrew word for holy is uh, Kadesh. Kadesh means something that is withheld from ordinary use and it's treated with special uh, care. So God is holy. Um, and since the God we serve and the God we worship is holy, uh, it means that holiness is God's perfection. And uh, pursuing holiness should be our standard for our moral character and the motivation for our lifestyle. Everything that we do, everything that we think, you know, a standard should be holy, okay, which means that, uh, you know, it should not be stained by anything that is uh, uh, sinful, that is evil. Uh, it should, uh, uh, you know, it should not be uh, touched by anything that is uh, evil, okay. And um, we should live lives uh, holy in God's sight, which means that, you know, um, that we 
uh, dedicate or consecrate our minds, our bodies, our wills totally for, uh, you know, the special use of God. And so we treat ourselves, uh, treat our uh, faculties uh, to be holy, uh, consider ourselves to walk in holiness because it's written in First Peter chapter 1, verse 16, that, uh, you know, be holy as I, for I am holy. God says that even in the Old Testament, that is his standard he has laid for us. The standard that he's laid for us is be holy for I am holy, or be holy as I am holy. So that is God's perfection, that is God's pursuit, or that's God's purpose for which he created us. Uh, and that should be something that we pursue, uh, for, you know, for our, our moral character and the motivation for our lifestyle, okay? He's not only holy, but he's, always, he's also righteous. Um, that means he's right in what he does. Um, Jeremiah chapter 9, um, verse 24. Let me just look at where Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24 is. Yeah. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. Sorry. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24 says that um, I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. So the Lord delights in um, righteousness. Okay, he's a righteous God. He delights in doing things that are righteous, that is right. Uh, he uh, only does and only commands others to do what is right according to his own law. Uh, we read this in uh, Genesis chapter 9, Genesis chapter 9, verses, uh, sorry, Genesis chapter 18, verse 25, where it says, But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. Sorry, that I read Jeremiah 9, 24. Uh, you know, sorry about that. Um, yeah, he delights in righteousness, but uh, he not only uh, does and not only commands others to do what is right according to his law, which is given to us in Genesis chapter 18, verse 25. The latter half or the last phrase says, shall not the judge of the earth do what is right? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So, you know, whenever we understand God's ways or uh, we think is God doing anything that's right in my life, everything is going wrong, we need to understand that God is righteous. He always does what is right. If there are things that are happening in our life that is not right, uh, you know, then it's something that we have fallen short. We have gone away from God. Uh, that sin that is, uh, you know, that we are facing the consequences for. But we know that God is always right. He will do what is right for us. And uh, also he is a righteous God and he requires a righteous standard. That means he requires us to live right in his eyes, uh, right in the eyes of uh, the world as well and right in his own presence and in his own, in his, uh, uh, in his sight. Okay. So he is holy and righteous. Um, He's also sovereign, okay? Um, now, what do we understand that he is sovereign? Uh, sovereignty of God means that he is absolute. He's the master. He's the Lord. He's the ruler over everything. Everything yields to him and everything bows down um, to him. We read this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now, in his sovereignty, God has chosen, um, you know, and entrusted uh, or determined to give man a free will, okay? That means we have the free will to choose whatever we want. And whatever we choose, God respects man's choice. So in his sovereignty, he has given us uh, the free will uh, to choose, okay? The free moral will he's given us so we can choose. And whatever we choose, whether it's right or wrong, God respects man's 
choices. That does not mean that he uh, he likes the wrong choices or he appreciates the wrong choices that we make. No, he just respects uh, the choice that he uh, that we make. And God is so secure in His sovereignty that He is not afraid in giving up or releasing His control as far as uh, uh, you know us human beings in us uh, choosing uh, depending on our free will that He's given to us. Now, when God has given us a free will, uh, we can choose things and we can choose things that are con contrary to his purposes, that will go against his purposes, that will go against his will. Now, even if it goes against his purpose and his will that he has planned for us or planned uh, uh, the plans that he has for humanity as a whole um, or for his purposes to come into being can be trotted by man making the wrong choices. But even though man makes those wrong choices, God is still secure in his sovereignty. He is not afraid uh, that he has given up his control to man and everything is going chaotic and you know there's no order there's there is total confusion no no he's not afraid of that uh, he respects man's choices for example in the garden of eden when um, you know uh, god created adam and he he told them not to eat from the fruit that uh, of, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil but did god know that they're going to eat yes then, uh, you know, all the questions, why did he make that tree? Why did he tell them, you know, why did he put it in the Garden of Eden? Well, God has given us the free will to choose. And uh, people said, you know, people say uh, God could have stopped Adam and Eve, but God has given us the free will to choose and he respects our uh, choices. So he respected Adam and Eve's choice. Uh, he knows everything is going to be chaotic from then, but God already had a plan in place where he's already planned of sending his son to save the world. So whatever man does, and it even though it thwarts God's plan, goes against his plan and purposes, God still is in control. He's still sovereign. He will still bring about and fulfill his uh, the plan and he purposes that he's already planned and willed for uh, for us and for the world okay but man has to face the consequences of his uh, choices man has to face the consequences of their uh, sins so man's freedom to choose and the choices he makes even though it opposes the purposes of god it no way undermines no way lessens no way weakens god's sovereignty God is still sovereign, he's still authoritative, he's still in authority, and he will still bring about his plans and he will fulfill his purposes, okay? So that is uh, the nine attributes of God that reveal his nature. We will look at more of them in the next class. Anyone has any questions? No? Sorry, I took two minutes extra time. Okay, we'll stop class here. If you don't have any questions, I would request you to please go through your notes. Uh, and if you have any doubts, uh, please ask next uh, class. Okay, okay, I'll see you all next week. Um, have a good weekend, a good refreshing, restful weekend and see you uh, next week. God bless you, everyone. Bye. Bye, Thank you. Thank you. Bye.